What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference, some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders. Paul will be there, Sarah Labs will be there, many other people will be there. And our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where a small group of six, seven, and eight-figure entrepreneurs come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. I'm very excited. Today we have Paul Johnson. He's co-founder of Seller Labs with Brandon Checkets. You can check out his interview on Inspired Insider also. They make valuable tools. I've used them for e-commerce sellers, including Feedback Genius, Snagshout, Scope, and Quantify. In the past four years, they've grown to more than 40 staff, and they develop applications for modern e-commerce businesses. And last year, Seller Labs helped their customers transact over $7 billion on Amazon. Paul, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's, I'm really excited. You know, this is exciting because there's so much stuff here. <clears throat> and with, I want you to talk about scope. You know, on the whiteboard, when we were talking, I always kind of peek over people's shoulders and see whiteboard. what's working in the seller labs behind the scenes. And one of the things is scope. And just, and I know you, uh, I also want to talk about Scrum with you because I sure. know you're Scrum certified and I want to hear about your process. <laughs> so, uh, you've done a lot of Googling. Yeah. So, What's behind you and with for and it's in regards to scope on that whiteboard? Sure. Yeah, so this is the whiteboard. Um, there's nothing too awesome for the Amazon seller on on the whiteboard. The whiteboard's more of just like our marketing launch sequence. Yeah. So we're in the process of rolling out scope to yeah. um, a small subset of our customers right now, and that's just how we're gonna do yeah. our marketing and everything. There's a webinar going on. Today. How do you roll it out? I want to I want to hear about because I do think it's applicable to Amazon sellers and I think that maybe and maybe you argue with me but Amazon sellers should be doing like a launch for their products or promoting more than just True. Amazon. Yeah, so um So how do you roll out scope? So scope is an interesting story. Scope has kind of been something I've been working on for a while. We've actually had two kind of products called Scope. Um okay. and we started working on Scope actually a couple of years ago and it's really we we've kind of released it and we've made a we made a bunch of improvements and we never really release it to the whole to the whole audience and we're still not actually released it to our whole audience just so yet what was so the beginning of scope what was the first version of scope and then the what's scope now yeah so the first version of scope was basically a a tool where you could put in a bunch of upcs and it would give you back, you know, the Amazon price, your profitability. You could actually put in a cost and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. like, and and it, so you'd say, I have a list from a supplier. You know, I went to ASD or whatever. I got their supplier list. You put it in, and then you get back a bunch of like profitability and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Scope doesn't even do that anymore. Actually, we we might end up adding that feature back in, but um, Scope is now why why did you change? Um. When we first released, we had a few people kind of a few power users use it, but typically, like, you know, most people would come in, run a list, and find value, and that was it, right? It was and, a one shot and, thing. Yeah, and and a yeah. lot of people don't have lists either. Like, there's only a small subset of of people that have lists, and there's also a lot of other people, you know, that have different types of like analyzers that do that kind of thing. So it wasn't very unique. Yeah. And so we decided to kind of focus on like the real mission of scope has been like to catalog the Amazon database. Like mm -hmm. that's what we've been trying to do. And yeah. so we have, you know, millions and millions of keywords yeah. that we have identified that are searched on Amazon. And then we actually run those through Amazon. We map those to all kinds of different products. Mm -hmm. We have, um, so you can come into scope and you can put an ASIN in and it will show you, 
that ASIN, it'll if, if we've been tracking it, it'll have historic uh, review count over time. It'll have the price over time, the sales rank over time, um, all these the ratings over time. It's really interesting. Like when you see, you can look at you can look at ASINs where like you know after the policy updates, you can see like some ASINs that had a lot of incentivized reviews. Maybe like some of them got deleted. So it got see, dro- it dropped in the rankings big time after. Yeah, you can, you can see that, right? You yeah. can see that. You can see how it was affected. You can kind of look in there and see if somebody's like, if they're how like if you're looking at sourcing a product, you can see like the trends and stuff like that. Um, but I think like the real valuable thing with Scope is like for any ASIN, any any popular product, you mm-hmm. can basically find um, the uh, the keywords that are yeah. ranked. And what yeah, drives. when I read that on your site, it's sophisticated Amazon keyword research and product discovery. So it helps people with probably sponsored ads, I would assume. If it gives Sponsored you keyword ads research. and listing optimization, right? And and so back to your original question, like how do we launch a product? Like when we first launched Scope, again, it was you know we 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 had a waiting list of people that had signed up for the beta, and we rolled it out to them. And it was a product research tool for sourcing, and then it was also a tool for uh, kind of keyword research. And the yeah. keyword research was actually somewhat weak; we weren't all the way there with it yet. The product sourcing part was pretty good. So we do like sales estimates and, and those kind of things. Um, and But we found that most people actually valued the keyword mm. part of it. And so mm-hmm. that's kind of how we iterate. So we'll we'll like, we'll like give something to people. We'll see what they do. We'll see how they use it. We'll right. look at the churn rate on the software and everything. Yeah. And we'll look at pricing and, and all those things. And then we'll, we'll take that back to our product team and develop more features that people want. And then now we feel like we have a really good product. So now we're now we're not really testing the product anymore. We're all, we have a pretty solid roadmap. We know what we want to build. We're testing the messaging and the marketing of it. And so we're in the process of instead of like hitting up our entire list, right? Hit up like a small segment of our list, right? And we're actually selling like today, like actually in thirty minutes, Jeff is starting a webinar. And it's the cheapest we'll ever sell scope. Like it's our annual kind of like our introductory thing. So who and gets as, on the webinar? Is it customers from other products or do you promote it to other people? Yeah. So we actually, for this first webinar, we just sent out an email to like 5,000 of our best customers, a lot of them, and that kind of fit the right criteria. Yeah. Said, hey, you want to join this webinar? And then this is tip like most of our webinars, we replay them. This webinar, we're not replaying it. It's just, you know, this is... Because it's going to have a lower cost, so you don't want to replay lower cost. that. Yeah. Exactly. This is, our, this is our webinar. So, you know, we're always experimenting with things. So we'll, we'll try yeah. annual pricing, we'll try monthly pricing, Yeah. you know, all kinds of different stuff like that. And so that's kind of what the whiteboard is, just like a strategy of how we're going to do that. I think the biggest thing, kind of pushing it back to like the Amazon seller, is, is understanding... Um, Understanding your audience and being yeah. willing to change, not just like picking a strategy and sticking right. with it. Right? Right. Like the thing is like, um, and for example, for Scope, like it's taken me two years to really get the product that I had envisioned. It's right. actually been a huge challenge. We've had to overcome a lot of obstacles to be able to actually engineer right. what we've engineered. But now and that people Scrum, not using Scrum, it takes them five years, right? <laughs> well, we haven't <laughs> always been very good at Scrum. Like, so if you think about like software development, you know, when we first started, basically what we would do is we would have an idea and we would start writing code and we would just like start coding. And right. then we got to the point where we're like, well, what if we like draw out on a mock-up tool, like just a wireframe of like what we want to build and like, right. let's talk about it first. And then we ended up getting some UI designers. And so then we're like, okay, they actually design the user interface. They come up with like high fidelity mockups, even a prototype. That, you know, you can take a product and you can have somebody design it in a week and say like, this is what it's going to do. When you click here, it does this and this. And then after you do that, um, after you've done all that, then you can kind of bring it in more into the scrum process of like breaking it down into stories and and breaking it down into Mm -hmm. one week sprints. And, I think the the best thing about Scrum and it's more like Scrum is just a methodology. Really, it's about being agile. So agile right. is the philosophy, right? And right. And then Scrum is like just a framework that you can use, mm-hmm. and and so you can use different types of agile frameworks. Scrum just happens to be the one that we chose to use. Yeah. 
But the idea is like shipping good software that people can use as fast as possible. And, and like we've, we've done the opposite of that. Like scope is like two years is a long time to be developing. Like you can ask the people in the industry, they're like, Paul, you've been promising scope forever. And I'm like, it's here, finally. Like last year, people were giving me crap at Prosper because they're like, when are you going to launch Scope? Because we had it on the website. And I was like, it's going to be here, I promise. Um, but What's now, the messaging? Talk about the messaging for a second. Because I think the message, you're talking a lot about the messaging and then user testing with the audience. And I think this can apply to any Amazon sellers. You know, the messaging on their, whether it's their, their, their detail page or their bullets is really, you want to hit home for the audience. What is the messaging? What have you come up with right now for scope? Yeah, so I think like the trick is understanding why people are using your product, like what problems it solves, mm -hmm. right? So for scope, like it solves. So for example, if you're running a PPC campaign, um, the strategy right now is go into Amazon, run an auto-targeted campaign, mm -hmm. get a hundred keywords, half of them are crap. I spend a couple hundred bucks, like wasting money basically to find some stuff that's actually working. Then, then turn shut down things, everything else. Shut down that, turn it into a, a, an, an actual exact match thing. Whereas like Scope, it's come into Scope, identify your top three competitors, harvest all the keywords that are working for them, start your PPC ad off right. on the right thing. And so the messaging, like that- Harvest like, your competitors' keywords is the, is the title. Yeah, I mean, that's like- I, I don't have like all of our bullet points like perfectly, but the idea was that's like, pretty good. Harvest your competitors' keywords. <laughs> the framework is like yeah, or stop wasting money on auto automatic ads or whatever. Like the, tr it's not really like exactly the words you use. I think it's more like understanding that that's what people wanted, right? And like we didn't start with that idea, right? Um, it's a little bit easier to do that in software, like in the physical product business. Like it's expensive to go and like change the product all the time. But you can do smaller runs, you can do different things like that. But the, the trick is like talking to your customers and understanding. That's a novel idea. It really <laughs> is. I mean, like, especially with, with Amazon, like the idea is like I'm going to create this passive income and Amazon's going to do the support for me and I'm just going to like ship stuff well, into FBA. Part of, what you, part of obviously what Feedback Genius is, is that for Amazon sellers, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for Feedback Genius, like, everyone's like, I want to get reviews. I want to get feedback. But you could also, like, literally at just, how's it going? Like, tell me how you like my product, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then with Feedback Genius, you can monitor reviews. Yeah. I think it's really important to look at the negative reviews in your product. Like, so what not, should people do, yeah, by looking at their negative reviews and other people's? So I talk to a lot of customers, and they're like, Paul, I got these all my competitors are leaving me negative reviews and, and they're, 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 you know, my customers are stupid and I'm like, no, maybe your product is not good. <laughs> like, it can it never be that, right? Yeah. And so I think like if enough people are saying like you are going to have, you, if you're in a popular thing, you might have some, you can't please everybody. And then yeah. maybe you're going to have a competitor mess with your listing or something. But like in general, if there's a common theme, throughout your product, you should fix it. It's, right. it's, it's not, it's not, it's not rocket science. And a lot of people know this, but it's, 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 you know, pretty simple. Like look at your reviews. Don't just think, okay, how do I get rid of this? How do I turn the, you know, you should do that. You should try to turn it into a positive, yeah. but you should also figure out how you can improve your product and make it better. So talk about feedback genius for a second, Paul, and what are some mistakes people make because you probably see a lot of stuff come through across your desk. What are the mistakes people make while communicating with their buyers? Sure. Um, and then what are some good best practices? Yeah, sure. So I think um, some common mistakes. So some people are too aggressive. I feel like they're kind of, I mean. Like too much of a discount or what, what do you no, mean No, it's like too spammy, right? Like it's like. I don't want to, I don't have a specific example on top of my mind, but if you, it'd be like giving, like one thing you could do to make sure that your message doesn't come off like spammy is to, is to send the sequence to someone that you trust, but is going to give you a straight opinion and be like, Hey, if you got this, if you got this email sequence from, from, you know, somebody on Amazon that you bought a product for, like, how would, how would you feel? 
So in other words, I think HubSpot actually says this. It's the somebody says this, but like your grandma the, test or someone. It's or, the marketing golden yeah. rule. It's market unto others as you would have them market unto you. I right. mean, that's like the idea, right? And what so, if they like being marketed in spammy ways? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they do. I'm just kidding. That's, I mean, they do definitely need outside help. But like, I think the idea is. Like, so some people have, we don't like restrict the number of messages you can send, right? You can send one to six or a hundred messages. So is that typical? I find that do other, other softwares, um, only let you do, I feel like other ones only let you send one or is that, am I making that up? Only a couple let you restrict you, not that many. Um, but I think that, you know, if you're following up with somebody, 12 weeks or six months after they ordered, you need to have a good reason to do it. I'm not yeah. saying that you didn't. I'm just saying. So yeah, seeing- what do you recommend as follow-up? Like let's say the, the message is spot on, you know, you deliver value. Maybe you give them a discount. I don't know if there's anything else you suggest they put in, you put in there. Keep it about the, keep it about customer service and about the order and about pleasing the customer more so than, you know, asking them to do something for you. Like, yeah, that's my opinion. Like, and that's what Amazon wants too, right? Like yeah. they don't want you really using, it's, it's, it's kind of like Jedi marketing, right? Like you're not, you're, you're asking for a review, but really you're like, so for example, like a good message is, and this is kind of something you can do with feedback genius because we actually integrate with the shipping carrier, which is kind of our unique thing. So you can mm. send a message like right when an order is delivered mm. and you can say, Hey, it looks like your order was just delivered. Um, you know, by UPS, you can That's even cool. say or something, right? Yeah. It looks like it was just delivered. Um, want to make sure you got it. Like, make sure it didn't, you know, get lost. Like, um, if there's any problems, please let us know. We'll take care of it. So you can kind of like preemptively do customer service. Yeah. And then also, though, you're at the height of uh, excitement for, for most sure. products. Like most products, some products take a while to work. Like if it's a supplement or something like that. But for a lot of products, they're going to get that instant satisfaction like right when they right, get it right and so if you have an, in, an email in their inbox that's a great time to yeah. to make sure there's not a problem make sure that they're going to be really happy with the customer support right it's top of mind yeah and then ask for a product review right then or that's a, a really cool feature so they yeah. can actually it can coincide with when it's delivered yeah and then you can do like another one like i want to follow up one week later and you can say, hey, like for this one, you're not going to talk about the delivery, but you're going to say like, hey, you know, you got your product. I know you got your product a week ago. Just want to make sure it's still working for you. Make sure there's no issues. Like you can just keep it strictly about customer service and then be like, oh, by the way, will you feedback, you know. So if you, I think keeping it customer focused and, and positive on their experience is a better, yeah. better way to do it than, you know, just saying, hey, leave me a review. Hey, give me feedback. Hey, you know, et cetera, et cetera. What's the frequency, Paul, that you've seen work the most frequent? Like someone has whatever twenty messages. What have you seen work well? Is on average, do you recommend doing one message, three messages, two, seven? Two, message, two, two. Is, is good. Two is yeah. good. So like run one right when they get it, and one like a week or ten days later or something. Yeah, and then you can also like set filters to where if they've already left you feedback or review or something, you don't necessarily have to do the follow up message. Mm-hmm. So you can do things like that. But, um, yeah, I would, I, would, I would start with two. So the one thing about Feedback Genius is we have pretty good analytics in there. So you can always see what works best yeah. for you, which is kind of interesting that um, – Have you seen a longer sequence work better for a certain product type? Sure. Um, well, I couldn't give you a specific category. But, um, okay, yeah, I can. So anything to do with supplements or health – like a longer sequence is better or like diet, like things that you, that take a long time to work. <laughs> yeah. Like 60 days later, like did, is this still sitting in your bathroom cabinet? You've not opened it yet. You know, like, yeah. Right. Well, I mean like if you think it's hard to ask for a product review for like a dietary supplement or something like that, yeah. like on day one, right? Hey, how did it work for you? Like give me a review. This is like, magic bullet. Yeah. You're better asking 60 days later when they've actually used it for a little while. Right. And yeah. so you could keep feeding them encouragement, right? Like if one of your, even if it's like a, maybe it's not even a supplement, maybe it's like a workout device or something like that. And you say like, Hey, like, you know, you bought your thing. Like you, like, let's say we, did, this is, I'm just making this up, but let's say we did, um, a, a workout fitness product. We launched it right at the beginning of the year. We changed all of the feedback genius messages to be like new year's resolution focused. And it's like, Hey, you bought this thing. 
and you know, let's help you keep your New Year's resolution, like yada 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 type thing. Make Here's it very specific, like, yeah. Make it. I mean, you could do that, right? And and that could work really well. Um, you're not. That's creative, right? That's going to take a little bit of thought on on the product owners. Yeah. Have. So like a lot of people have really interesting dialed in messages that work really well for their brand. And then if you went and did it for something else, it, you know, it, it wouldn't make sense. So why Feedback Genius? That was your first product, right? Solar Labs. Oh, this is a funny story. So um, why Feedback Genius? So we actually had a business selling everything, like literally everything. It was like the micro Amazon. And yeah, I think you guys had like a like a seventeen thousand square foot warehouse or something. Yeah, had, yeah. had a seventeen thousand square foot warehouse, and and one of the things we sold was loose mix media, which is CDs and DVDs and video games not in their case. And it seems like a pain. Yeah, they made a lot of money, so we huh. would buy them in bulk for like you know five hundred dollars and make ten grand off of it or something like wow. that. So it was like a nice little thing, nice little business. And um, anyway, the problem was that even though explicitly in the notes on the Amazon product, we would say this does not contain the original artwork, it's in a generic case, like everybody was leaving us negative feedback. Right. And so we already had like the system to run our business that like pulled in all the orders and did all this stuff. So Brandon, like one day, actually I went to the beach and I came back and he's like, I have a new product. It's an email tool. <laughs> and this is what we're going to do. And he's like, check it out. You can like put a filter on here by SKU. So we prefixed all of our loose mixed media with the SKU LMM. And so you can do this in Feedback Genius. And so like he said, anything that starts with the LMM, we're going to send this message. And it's mm. going to be, and in Feedback Genius, it's pretty cool. So you can say like, I want to send this message as soon as the order's placed, like before it's even shipped or confirmed or anything. And he would send that message. And they would be like, hey, we noticed you just bought this product name. Like, by the way, here's the description again one more time. Like, it doesn't come in a case. You know, it doesn't come with the original link. If you want to cancel your order, click here. Otherwise, we'll ship it to you. You know, thank you very much. That, like, reduced negative feedback. You preemptively sent a message. So Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a lot of people have problem products. Like, people don't. No, you know, maybe there's a special instruction they need to do. Maybe, maybe you, I mean, I bought one thing. This was kind of bad, but like I bought a game on Amazon and it was a card game. And it didn't, it was like this new card game and it didn't come with instructions. Like maybe they forgot to print it or something. I don't know. Good luck with it. Well, yeah. they could have at least used Feedback Genius to like preemptively send out the instructions. Like, hey, we know we don't have instructions. We're stupid. But here is the, uh, you know, instructions digitally, right? You can put them on. So, yeah, that's how it started was kind of to solve a problem. That's how most of our products. Yeah. So you have a secret sauce, Paul, that you're using for your business. So when do you decide to actually share it and create a business out of it? Yeah, so we went to a different conference. I won't name it. Um, an Amazon conference. This is before prosper. Okay. Um, and, uh, we went out to the, um, to the, to the show and we looked at all the solution providers there. We were actually kind of, at one point we've gone there before looking for something to run our business. We didn't really find anything. We made the software ourselves. And then we were like, we went again and we were like, man, like there's a huge opportunity here in the software. The opportunity for us, like what we really want to do. You wanted to purchase a better solution from someone else possibly? Yeah, I mean like we're always looking for the best. Like like when we were e-commerce, when we were actually focused on, you know, selling products and making a profit, that was our focus. The goal was to have the best tool for the job. Yeah. Right. And we couldn't find one that did what we wanted to. Like we couldn't. And and so we started building our own solutions. Yeah. And and then we started realizing that our solutions were really good. Right. And better than it was on the market. And we started realizing that, you know, yeah, we can make X amount of dollars selling these product this thing, but like the opportunity here is billions of dollars. Yeah. And we don't have enough capital, basically. Like we could hog it all for It's a very stuff. capital intensive business. It's a huge cap yeah. yeah. E commerce is like I I think that a lot of people think that they're going to get into Amazon. Maybe they took a course or something and they have like $5,000 and they're going to like make a billion dollars. And that's not true. Like what is true is that you can probably turn your inventory every 90 days if you're doing well 
and you can make you know twenty to thirty percent returns every ninety days. Like that's right. a reasonable thing. Right. So there you're making you know thirty percent returns every ninety days. That's pretty good. I mean, you take a hundred thousand right. dollars and you turn it every ninety days. Yeah. That's great. But it's a it's I kind of call it a rich man's game, right? It's it's somebody who has access to capital. Yeah. Like whether you're gonna get it financed or you can get investors or whatever. We had the capital, but we still realized that the opportunity was bigger for software, right. which is why we got into software. And also we realized that like even if we had billions of dollars, there was no way that we were going to capitalize on all these opportunities. Like we might as well get out and help other people and help them capitalize yeah. on the opportunities as well. So Paul, how long from when you, okay, you're using what's now called Feedback Genius to when you actually released it to the public to use uh, e-commerce founders for their consumption? Yeah, it wasn't that long. So we really like kind of started Feedback Genius in like March. Um, now we had a bunch of other software before this that you was did. actually powering. We never released it. We actually had a full-on inventory management system and repricing and all kinds of stuff. Um, but it wasn't ever built. It was all tuned for our business. When we built, when Brandon built Feedback Genius, he built it. We built it with the intention of like we're gonna make this work for ourselves, but we're also going to make this work mm -hmm. for other people. Like we knew you were designing kind of the foundation for other people's use as well. Yeah, we we knew we knew at feet when we started Feedback Genius that we were solving our own problem, but that this was gonna be our first yes. product to bring to market. So I think why did like, you decide hey, on that? Because were you talking to other founders and they're like, yes, we want that. You would you say like, oh, we have this inventory management thing and this feedback, or was it just your intuition? It was the easiest thing to bring to market. Like, it was a lot easier to bring to market than than an inventory management tool. Mm -hmm. Like inventory management that is fits everybody is really hard, and the sales cycle is like really really long. Yeah, like you're 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 go like. To ask somebody to like use your tool, like now I'm not discounting Feedback Genius as like engineering. Like we've done a lot right. of engineering on Feedback Genius. It's not like anybody can come up. People can build it. There's other email solutions that people like pop up. That's that's it's it's pretty easy to build something that sends an email. To build something that Feedback Genius does is very complicated. Right. But to but it's a it's the sales cycle that's the hard part. Like I, I you can have the best engineered inventory management system in the world and it's going to be really hard to convince your customer acquisition cost is just really high mm -hmm. like trying to get somebody onto that platform because they have to change all of their business processes and everything it's a lot and more most, onboarding time and yeah and most most of that software is really opinionated and we thought like we're going to build this thing it's going to be great like and then we build it and we kind of started getting beta testers on that and everybody wanted it to be different right they're like we want it to work for this way of doing it. And then we're like, well, crap, we never thought about that. And then we're like, so we like would make a change. And the next person would come along and be like, well, I wanted to do this. And we're like, this is terrible. <laughs> like, we don't like this at all. We want you to just use our software the way we built it. Like, and so we, we kind of realized in our first year of business that we were going to focus on um, feedback genius. Feedback genius, and, and then also we kind of realized that we we're going to focus on the whole market shifted, right? We went from people that had a hundred thousand SKUs to make a million dollars to people that had a, you know, a hundred SKUs to make a million dollars. Why did that shift? Because so everyone went to private label and doing their own brands and stuff like that. I mean, there's still a lot of people that, if you actually look at the data, the resellers are still making mm -hmm. more money like revenue wise, but like the, what would the you interest, tell people to do if they're starting, would you say go the reseller route or go private label route? Um, it depends on the person. Yeah. First of all, so a lot of people that are resellers have a background. I kind of think of them as like finance type people. They're almost like if you're coming from the stock market, like you're looking for securities or commodities or whatever to trade and you want to kind of like buy low, sell high. So you can predict a little bit easier with the yeah. with the brand. You mean Yeah, with the brand you can say like you can look and say like, okay, let me find like you're you're purchasing an asset, you're putting it into the marketplace, you're selling it, you're you're turning it over, you're willing if you're willing to kind of move and change a lot and stuff like that, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if you're more of like a market 
marketer type person and you're you really interested in like creating and like doing a brand yeah, yeah then i think doing your own brand i don't really like the word private label although i use it a lot but i like what the would idea you, what would, what's a better word a small manufacturer your own brand or yeah something? your own brand yeah. something like that right like really creating something of value i mean you can we've proven that you can do your own brand with just taking something off Alibaba and slapping your logo on it, right. like that works. So, what were some of the at the time? Because you don't run. I mean, I I at least plug it anymore, right? So, so <laughs> can you talk about what was successful that you sold? And yeah. What was was not as successful that you sold? So, most of our stuff that we sold was successful. So we had two kind of businesses. We had because you would of- buy like just boatloads of pallets of stuff right yeah so my understanding like like books and not a private label business or a reseller business our (laughs) business was this other type of business that it's like a liquidation business right yeah i break down e-commerce into like like the amazon business into like four models okay go ahead you have your scouters or your retail arbitrager type people they're they're looking around finding deals kind of you know hustling right yeah then you have your um liquidators and those are people that buy in bulk. They buy liquidation. They move through it. Then you have your resellers, and then you have your you know small brand, big brand, your brand owners, right? Yeah. You, you own the brand. Yeah. We were liquidators for the most part. Yeah. We bought. I started off kind of as a reseller buying. I bought. It was a li- It was half liquidation, half resell. So I bought musical instruments from one of the largest uh they would get all of the seconds and scratch and dents and and stuff mm-hmm. from all the guitar manufacturers that was and a discount guitar warehouse that, discount that you were in okay yeah and that was mainly an ebay business actually hmm. um but that did you know that did really well we made you know a few hundred thousand dollars you were in college at the time right running yeah in college yeah. Yep. pretty pretty good for yeah, a college student good. yeah yeah and then and then we discovered the postal auction how did you discover that I, I Google, I guess. I don't know. I was just like somehow I learned that there was the postal auction and it was in Atlanta. Yeah. So walk and, me through. You see it on Google. Then what happens? Well, okay. So Brandon, me and Brandon are eating lunch at this like Japanese steakhouse, and he's like, "Hey, I got some extra money." I you guys are rich college students. Japanese. Steakhouse. No, he's not a college. Student. Oh, okay. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, I got some money and I want to do something with it. And I was like, what do you want to do? And he's like, well, I don't know. I, I already do a lot of stuff with books. You know, I'm thinking about buying some books, you know, anywhere where we can get some books. And I was like, yeah, I read online that you can go to the postal auction in Atlanta and buy books. So we go to the postal auction in Atlanta and like they have everything there. Like everything that's lost in the mail is there. They have like, they have these, it's, a, it's called a Gaylord, which is a funny name. It's like this giant pallet that has a box on it. And so if you go to the grocery so you store, can't you can't like, see what's in it. Uh, you can see the top, but that's it, right? And so you can buy like a Gaylord of books. And the books, were, the Gay- a Gaylord of books was selling for like two grand. And we were like, this is crazy. And then, but they have everything else there, computers, iPhones, gold, like everything, just all this stuff. So you can choose what category? Like I want you the electronic hit, like, category. Uh, so they, they separate the auction into like, you know, 300 lots. And you just, you just bid on a lot. So like one lot is a Gaylord of books. And it's, you know, whatever. So we're like sitting there doing math. We're like, okay, there's like the, 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 the it's, it's like the it's, jelly bean it's, game. It's How many jelly high and right. this big and there's this many books in there and the average book price is going to be this and how much is this thing worth and, right. you know, blah, blah, blah. So we like go and then the bidding starts. Like, we think this is worth like $1,000 a pallet and they go for like two and we're like, all these people are insane. What's well, happening? And we leave. And then the next month that happens again and we're like, well, let's go back. That was really interesting. Let's actually buy something this time. Let's just do it. So we just decide we're going to buy a pallet of books. We don't care how much it costs. Like if it's $2,000, like whatever. So we buy a pallet of books. It's a curiosity. I just want to see what's in that box. Yeah. So we buy, it's like storage wars, right? So we buy like a pallet of books and we buy a thing of electronics actually. So the, so the books go to Brandon's garage and the electronics come to my spare bedroom actually so you can't live anymore yeah and uh and so that's where so i put the electronics on so that's where plug it kind of came that's the name plug it Mm. came from and then he his business was check it books and um and so we kind of had these two businesses 
And so I mine was full of like a bunch of laptops. A lot of them needed like hard drives and stuff. So they pulled the hard. So I like fixed them all up, got them on eBay, sold them, you know. And then Brandon like did like he already had books got at the time. So he wrote like this special software that would like price them and and everything. Yeah, and you could I, put in. I remember you could put in whatever the the code is, and it would it would create. Yeah. Yeah. You do everything. You yeah. just put, you just scan the UPC and UPC, then it's like yeah. find it on Amazon. You, you scan the UPC or the ISBN, sorry. Scan the ISBN, choose a condition, and then it would put it on Amazon. Yeah. It would tell, it, eventually it would tell the, the employee where, if we were going to send it to Amazon, if we were going to put it on our shelves, or if we were going to recycle it. And it would do all the pricing for them. We had automatic pricing and everything. So it was literally like scan a book, choose a condition, put it somewhere. We like, we so you were sort of liquidators, resellers. I mean, you were reselling the like books and other things right we were buying liquid we were sourcing it from liquidators right right, right. and then we were like reselling it on amazon yeah. but it, that like it's the way you get your inventory as way i look at it but yeah by the end of it like we ended up mer- we didn't really merge the companies financially but we merged them with like kind of staff and like uh, and, and warehouse processes so we had yeah. this like seventeen thousand square foot warehouse i was building ebay software brandon was building amazon software like we kind of like put them together and we had we had you know this big warehouse, and we had some people that worked on the kind of plug it business, some people that worked on uh, the book business, shared resources, mm-hmm. and it the you know I can't say like oh there was just one product. I mean I can tell you products that made us a lot of money. Like one of the things that made us the most money was we had one lot of sporting goods we bought, and it was like a couple thousand dollars, and like in that lot there was these broadheads, which are like arrowheads that you put on a bow and arrow hmm. that people use for like big game hunting like you can kill an elephant with it or something really? like that. and those things we made like fifteen thousand dollars off of that then, that's a cool niche business the yeah area. we sold them and then they were done right like right. and that was it and then we had i mean we there was one thing we got i got like ten thousand dollars of the dental drills in there or something like that i mean it was just random stuff right but th- those businesses did really well the book business was like that business was like buy stuff you you research it, you figure out what yeah. it is, you put it on the internet, and then yeah. you sell it, right? The book business was similar, but it was like an economy of scale thing, right? It was more competitive. You need the infrastructure, yeah. Much more scalable. We ended up kind of really losing our minds and deciding to buy double stack tractor trailer loads from Goodwill. So it's like, you know, thousands and thousands of books. And we had it tuned into a process. It was like, Five thousand dollars for a tractor trailer, maybe, and it was like seven thousand like into our warehouse or something like that, and then you could we could process them for like three or four, and then over the course of the year they like net out like nineteen thousand dollars or something like that. Yeah. We kind of had it like tuned in really well, um, but then the thing that we screwed up on was, and this was with all of our e-commerce, was we were terrible at operations. We always ran our businesses like. A, a, a software company and so what do you mean we never no one ever had a schedule really like we didn't like people could kind of come and go like we they had to clock in hourly but there wasn't like a lot of controls in place it wasn't like a strict you know environment it's not a work from home type of environment <laughs> it, it, yeah it, it should yeah. have been much much more strict and we kind of let it be very nice and and and, and uh like if i walked you around the office today like it's you know we have 40 employees but you know only 10 of them are in the office right now. That's the way we've always done business. Right. It works great for a software company. It doesn't work very good right. for, for an operation. So that's where we were That's where we were weak at. And we kind of realized, like, that's another reason why we decided to go into the software business was because we didn't want to run this like, really... I don't want to deal with a warehouse and inventory and all this other stuff. Right. And yeah. so like in the meantime, like Brandon had done another business with his brother that was more of like the traditional FBA business. And we had done a lot, some FBA stuff as well. And um, I can't really talk about his brother stuff because it's still making lots of money. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they ended up buying a brand and, and doing really well with that. And we were like, okay, this is like a much more attractive style of business like you know leveraging amazon's fulfillment centers not being in your own like i would never run a warehouse again like ever you're much better off like if you don't want to if you're not doing amazon you should at least use like a a 3pl or something like that any 3pls that you've discovered that you'd recommend to people to check out oh 
gosh. There's one man, I can't remember their name. They're like completely I haven't used them personally, but they seem really cool. They're like a big startup and everything they do they just got bought by another company and everything they do is like completely automated. They have an API mm. Um, you can tap into it. They're really high tech. I have to look at it. Um, I can't remember. Let me Google it really quick while we're talking. Yeah, because there's a few. I interviewed one. I think it was called Ship Bob. That was one that I that is doing something like that. Yeah, Ship Bob is one. Uh, I've interviewed the founder of that. That's sort of sort of similar. It's only in certain areas, certain cities though. Yeah, these guys are pretty big. They got bought by a company that everyone's heard of, and I can't remember. Mm. Well, if you think you'll let are. me know, and we can link it up there. Yeah, um, I, I I haven't used them, but they just seem like they have their act together. And I like the fact that they have an API for everything, which lets me know that if you need to develop your own solution, if you're big enough, we're using a third party logistics provider besides Amazon, like you're probably big enough to like pay a developer to hook some stuff together or you have some enterprise software on the back end. And right. so you want somebody with... It's a signal to you. It's, it's you know, kind of in it for the long haul. Yeah, there's, well, there's, I know they're in it for the long haul and I can tell that they're, they have all the technology yeah. where you can build really cool yeah. custom integrations that do interesting things. Yeah. That's why I thought they were neat. So, Paul, any other big mistakes that stand out to you that sellers are making? You know, one is... You know, some of the ones that you were talking about, like maybe not running the operations on a schedule or um, I know you're mentioning, you know, maybe spammy emails. What else are mistakes that you're seeing people make? And maybe it's with this, you know, kind of around the snag shout or scope. Um, yeah. So I think one of the biggest things that people do incorrectly is they waste their time on the products or the opportunities that aren't benefiting them right so it's the 80 20 rule yes right yeah. like i mean this is said over and over again but it's still good like you know 20 percent of our efforts make 80 percent of our money and so it's kind of pulling another product that we're accepting beta testers for right now is quantify yeah and so like what quantify does is we built i wanted to build this because of this exact phenomenon. Like, I think this is the biggest problem that established sellers have. Um, they have all of these SKUs. They, they're in love with all of them. Right. And a lot of them are either losing the money or they're just, yeah. uh, the opportunity cost is too high, right? And so it's sometimes hard. Like, I went to one person's warehouse and they were like, hey, we want, we want to we want you to help us um, get on an inventory management system. We want to like catalog everything. We want to do all this work. And I said, "Okay, do you know what your top ten SKUs are?" And they were like, "No, we don't." And I was like, "This is terrible." I mean, they had a multi million dollar Amazon business, and they couldn't even really even show me all of their stuff. And I've talked to a lot of people. They're like, "You know, I did a million dollars on Amazon, but I lost a hundred thousand or something like that and it's right. like you don't really know it's not what you, you know make you're it's making what you money, keep yeah, but yeah you, you know you're making money but you don't know you don't know what's making you money right you don't know what the winners and losers are so what are. are people doing are they using a spreadsheet how are they keeping track of it or... I mean I think there's like obviously a few products that are doing some things I think some people are using a spreadsheet if you look at like what um, if you look at all of the costs that are involved in an Amazon business, like there's so many got you's though. And that's really what we've been doing with quantify. All the fees you mean? Yeah. So like, it's not just your FBA fee and your, it's also your advertising fee. It's also your promotional fee. It's also your, um, at, what else? The return rate that you get on the product. Like there's all of these costs that go into yeah. a product. So we built quantify where you basically put in your loaded costs, which is like your cost to get it into fulfillment by Amazon, like whatever it is to get it in there. So we, where it's it's built for if you ha, if you're like receiving, so you calculate the shipping and the cost of the product, yeah, and, like, and maybe any labeling fees or things. Yeah, like you that. you kind of yeah. come up with an average price, right? So it might be a, let's say you have a water bottle and it's two dollars landed to FBA. So you put that cost in there, and then we instead of parsing twenty different business reports and doing all this crap, we pull it all together for you and let you see your your actual true profitability on that skew and 
the really interesting thing that we do though is we also have like it's 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 using the transactions API. So there are some other software providers that kind of try to make it up using the orders API, but I don't think anybody's really using the transactions API. And then we also have to pull in a ton of business reports from Amazon to like give you the full picture. Mm. And so I mean I think that we have the the most complete picture. Seems complicated. It's complicated and there's a lot of things you have to do on the to back end. Yeah. Really get that accurate thing. And it, the thing that we've really done is we've allowed, especially if you're a big seller, you can actually query your data kind of like in a nice user interface. So you can come in and be like, show me products that have, so we also pull in all of your conversion data and all of your, your um, different data points there, like your, your conversion rate and your sessions and everything. So you can say like, show me products that I have a high ad spend on that I'm losing money on. Or show me products that I have, um, you know, a, a lot of sessions, but poor profitability, whatever kind of questions you want to ask yeah. of your Amazon business, you can kind of ask that to quantify and then you can create a custom report and do that. And we've like generated all these things. So it's really nice if you have a lot of SKUs, but I guess one of the biggest problems that sellers, I think sellers have is that they don't understand their true cost. They're not tracking Anything, They're not tracking that performance. What you're saying, and, and then from tracking, choose your top 20% or 10% and maybe cut the fat off. Cut the fat off or figure out how to fix it, right? Like right. I can oftentimes come into somebody's business and if they put in their true cost, you can kind of like be like, okay, I just paid for my software for a year for you for the rest of eternity because right. I just saved you $5,000 <laughs> by stopping to sell this product. You right. know, you were burning five grand on this. Like that's an easy win. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a huge mistake I think people make um, is not understanding their business analytics. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Snackshow. Um, and it's interesting because Snackshow worked really well and then there was a review policy update. Yes. And so talk about what happened with that and then how Snackshow iterated. Yeah. So, I mean. So originally Snackshow was. It was a giveaway, a product in exchange for a review, right? Like yeah. that was kind of the thing. We, uh, I was, uh, it kind of came to me. We were having some conversations with customers with Feedback Genius, and they were like, "Feedback Genius is great to get reviews if I already have sales, but what do I do if I don't have any sales?" Everyone wants more sales, yeah. And what do I do if I don't have sales? How do I get reviews? And I was like, I don't know. And one day, <laughs> like, wait a minute, why don't we make a platform where you like give away a product in exchange for a review? And I think, I'm not saying that we were the first people to do that, but I think that we were one of the first and we were definitely like the biggest if, if you know, we were one of the biggest definitely. If I, I think, biggest. yeah, when I went on the site um, the other day and it said um, there's like 200,000 active shoppers or something. Yeah, 250,000 wow, shoppers. that's now. amazing. So we, we were really big, I mean pretty big for in that yeah. space. And, and so... You know, I always knew that it was a fine line. I always knew that, like, if giving away a product, you know, we have to have this disclaimer. We have to keep it legitimate. We can't, right. like, let They'd the have to seller... put a disclaimer, like, I received this for a discount or something like that. So right. people know that there was some incentive there for them to leave it. And we also had to make sure that the sellers couldn't influence the shopper to leave a positive review. We, we never let them communicate with the shopper we never let them i mean they could do a few feedback years but they didn't have like this kind of like they didn't have the authority to like ban somebody from the platform or le you know do we right. always make sure that the shoppers would be honest yeah and we were like really careful to do that and uh it was um it was kind of hard because some people would go and they put their product on snack shout and they'd get a bunch of negative reviews because their product was bad and they would call us up and they'd be like, we're going to go to your competitor. You know, we don't like you. you. You guys are terrible. You need to ban this person. They don't know what they're talking about, all this stuff. And typically, we would side with the shopper and say, like, no, they're being honest. We've, they've been on our platform for a long time. You know, every now and then there's somebody that was being malicious. But for the most part, that wasn't the case. Right. And a lot of other people in the space didn't have platforms that were nearly that honest, in my opinion. Um they would actually allow you to choose who got your product and they would pull in their ratings and they would pull in all this stuff. And if you went to, so you're you more likely to get someone who leaves a positive review. Completely. It was yeah. always, it was, it was the unwritten rule that if you, if they would pull in your average star rating 
of your reviews. And if you didn't have a four star rating on average, you would not get products. Like this right. would not give them to you. Right. And so everybody just would never give anybody, you know, you could read the forums. It was like, I don't get products. And, and so then you had like these guys like review meta and stuff going around scraping um, Amazon and like statistically proving that reviews that contained the disclaimer had a higher average star rating than reviews that didn't. And so I noticed this like early on. And so I made our, we started doing analytics, tracking our average review rating. And our average review rating was always closer in line to organic. It wasn't quite as good as organic. Yeah. Like it's low. Actually. Yeah. I mean, if someone's getting a free product, whether was, they're honest or not, they're yeah, going to, yeah, tend yeah, to. There was still a little bit, but yeah. I think we were getting really close. We were, we were, we were like at 4.4. And Amazon was at like 4.3 or something right. like that, average stars. Whereas, um, you know, the, the, uh, on average, if you just took the average of all of them, it was 4.7. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those had our incentivized reviews in there. So we were pulling the average down. So if you really looked at it, it was a bunch of five-star reviews that were getting generated from all these other websites. Right. Um, and Amazon like rightly had to do something about that. It was like Did a press nightmare. Did you see that ahead of time? Like, what was what was the writing you saw on the wall? My thing was my original thing was like maybe if we can like I wrote a big blog post about this. I was like maybe if we can like make a big enough stink about this, like Amazon will like allow us to continue, but like force these other guys out or whatever. But they didn't. They were just like, no, we're only gonna let the we're gonna control it. They just made a cut across and yeah, this, they is, said, this is the nope. line and no one's allowed to, yeah. No one but us. Now, they still do it. What do they do? They still have the Vine. It's the same thing as Snag Shell. It's just that you can't access it unless you're a um, vendor and it costs thousands of dollars. Mm. But you can use Vine if you're a vendor, if you're, if you're selling on first party and you can... It's like, you know, you, you can only get like 30. You can give about like 30 samples out, but it's exactly what snag shot was basically i mean we copied them in a lot of ways right like we we tried to make it better but like that's what we did mm -hmm. and we we use their same language and everything right and so they're still doing exactly what they did right because i think like a point to them like if they ever say that, you can't do it like you're doing it wrong with what we were doing i think it was right. great like, i think it was awesome just certain people maybe ruined it for the rest of they abused yeah. they abused yeah. it so then you know uh, jeff likes to say uh, I don't remember. It was like October third. October third at breakfast, everything was great. October third at lunch, everything sucked. Right? Like, basically, like we had this like huge disaster, right? And we we're like, what are we gonna do? So, and what so, did? Like, you, how do you hear about that? Like, do uh, you uh, just have customers emailing you frantically, or do you hear about it so, from Amazon? Oh, no, and we're talking yeah. about where they basically said they were removing all, or they weren't allowing people to do the. Effective immediately, you can't do discount. You know, you can't give away exchange. So, right. yeah, I don't know. Um, I think Jeff was the first person to find out about it. Probably someone hit him up on the internet or something, right? And then we were like, okay, like, you know, he called, and we were like, we immediately like went to work, like removing, like people didn't sleep for two days, like removing. So what did you do? Yeah, we just removed every single thing about reviews from our platform, and we, you know, and we email, we message everybody. And said that you know Snackshot is no longer a platform to get reviews. It's a platform to generate sales for your business. And a lot of people, you know, the strength in Snackshot was actually always about getting sales. Yeah, it's kind of funny, but like if you want your product to rank on Amazon, the way you win is selling more than your competitor. That's really it. Like if your competitor sells ten units a day, you need to sell eleven. That's how you win in search. That's really all there is to it. Yeah. And so we still knew that Snackshot was really valuable and really, really powerful tool. It's just that you weren't going to get that added bonus of a review. So you just had to remove language. The function's the same, but you have to remove language of you no longer have to leave a review and you do not need to put in some disclaimer. Yeah, I mean, we had a pretty... Did anything else change? We had, a, we had a pretty sophisticated system. So when somebody used to sign up for Snackshot, they used to have to link their Amazon account and it, after they linked their Amazon account, um, when they snagged a deal, they couldn't get another deal until we found their review for that product. And then after you had developed enough trust, we would let you get more deals at once, right? So yeah. it was pretty sophisticated. So we had to rip 
all of that functionality out. Mm. It actually simplified the platform, to be honest. And we didn't have to like start checking for reviews and it made it like the sign up process a lot easier and stuff like that, right? So we were able we still don't we still limit the amount of deals somebody can get just because we don't want one person grabbing all the stuff. Right. But we don't track reviews anymore. We don't collect we, we don't collect reviewer IDs. We don't we don't do any of that yeah. stuff anymore. And then we also completely changed our pricing model because Yeah, talk about how you came to the so before it was you pay per item, right? Yeah, Depending yeah. on your volume. So, so the value add was like very the value of Snackshot was very high because you were getting a review, right? Like it was very high because you had a it wasn't it was like an eighty percent chance if you sold an item on Snackshot, you'd get a review. Yeah. And so that's really that's a really high value. Like sellers are willing to spend yeah. five dollars for that, right? Yeah. Like it's it's really good. Especially if it's an honest review. Well, now Snackshot is a platform where you can sell a product for a discount and you can generate sales velocity. It's not you don't get the review. It's so still went valuable. From like sales velocity with the sale and the review really helped and now it went to more you could get a review, but it's really more for sales velocity. Yeah, it's more and more sales velocity. And so it's it's not in my mind, it's not as valuable. Like we can't charge as much, but we can't justify charging. But if they use feedback genius with that, then maybe they get a, a review. Yeah, right. Review, you know. but I still yeah. think the review rate's gonna be more like ten percent instead of eighty percent, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's not it's not as high it's not as high of a of a of a thing. And so we decided that we were gonna change pricing. And um, and so we changed pricing to be you know just pay as you go or monthly uh, subscription, and we really increased the value. So if you have one SKU, you can put it on there, and you can get unlimited snags. So that used to cost like for any product launch, you're gonna need to probably sell a hundred units. Yeah. So five dollars would be five hundred bucks for that month, bucks, possibly like thirty nine dollars a month. So how did you come to that price? That's a good question. I, we kind of, Tested. we kind of, we looked at the market. Um, we looked at where our customers kind of sat if everybody kind of stayed, and like if we would achieve revenue parity. And so we kind of looked at those things, and then we kind of, and then a lot of it was some of it was gut, too, right? I mean, we definitely took a revenue hit on Snagshell, like a big revenue hit. Um, but in the long run, we've basically set ourselves up for a unified solution. So we wanted to move everything to kind of monthly subscription pricing anyway. Yeah. Because we rolled out in and that beta. was a per product. Yeah, the before it was per product. Yeah, and so yeah. everything now, everything that Seller Labs has now, you can choose all the cart. You can pay twenty dollars for Feedback Genius mm -hmm. and forty dollars for Snagshell. But we're rolling out. We've started doing this in beta, Seller Labs Pro. Yeah, where you can buy all of our software and yeah. for one price. Hmm, that's cool. So how does that work right now? Well, right we'll put now, disclaimer subject to change because you may be adding other yeah other um, tools. But. So we are going to raise the price. Right now, the lowest is seventy nine bucks. Um, and you get everything. Yeah, it's not even advertised anywhere. It depends. It's on your order volume. So because I, I I know looking at the site, I don't think I saw anything that said it's Sellers not there. Pro on it. He knows about this, right? So if a bunch of people watch this and they sign up for Solaris Pro, I'll know where they came from. So how do they uh, even get to it? So the only nobody gets to it. There's um, like a secret. You should have like a secret spot on the home page where yeah, if you know to click the click something like the the little flask in the top left corner, then they get <laughs> to the pro. No, I think you can probably like do the URL. Like I think it's like. I don't know, sellerlabs.com forward slash pro or something. I don't know what the URL is off the top of my head, but yeah. there's a there's a page. But you're not really pushing it. We're not pushing it because it's um it's it, we don't have it completely automated. So basically, you go into it, you say you choose your order volume, and then you you say like I want pro, and then a customer service person has to set it all up for you mm -hmm. right now. And so we're kind of testing it out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically a way for you to bundle all of our, all of our stuff mm. together and we're pretty soon we'll roll that out automated, but if people are interested in it. They can just contact customer service and say, I want to be on pro. And basically it's just, we, we just look at it based on the size of your business. And, um, you know, obviously the bigger your business, the more work we have to do, right? You're going to use more snack shout. You're going to send more messages on feedback genius. You're going to have more orders coming in on quantify, et cetera, right. et cetera. And so that's kind of how we scale it. So 
Stag Shout right now, I mean, the, the pricing may change. Um, it's 39 for one, on for, end, yeah, for for one, one skew. skew. Limited, limited snags, though. Unlimited ska, snags for one skew is 39 And then there's a 99 99 Gives you five. Yeah, and then there's Different a, skews. Mm-hmm. All okay. the way up to unlimited. For Got it. And then and it I'm, keeps going up depending on how many products or SKUs you have. Yeah, so one thing that we're doing with Snagshot right now that's kind of interesting is not only will your product show up on Snagshot, but if you want to do like a one-time use code. So Snagshot supports uh, one-time use codes, I'm sorry. But then Amazon has this concept of like a multi-use promo code where you just put it out there and you can do like a 20% off deal and you can't really limit it. And yeah. um, But if you just want to run like an unlimited type deal, we've actually been working with a bunch of other websites to where we have an API and we have a WordPress plugin and stuff like that. And so you can actually have, um, you can put your deal on Snagshout mm -hmm. and then you can syndicate, you can make a syndicated deal and then we'll syndicate that out to partner websites. And That's so, cool. Yeah. So like, we so don't you get in front of a wider audience. You get in front of a wider audience. So like we don't have a whole lot of, that's cool. Yeah. A whole lot of partners yet, but one of them that we do have right now that's kind of in beta is slick deals. It's a pretty big deal. Slick deals, yeah. So you can get, you can do like a syndicated deal like on that. Snapchat. And you have to be, I, I think that counts as a campaign, but if you're, mm -hmm. right now, I think if you're on the $99 plan, we actually let you, we actually let you do those unlimited syndicated deals because we're trying to get that off the ground. Hmm. So not for the one one campaign, but for the for the ninety nine dollar a month. Ninety nine and up, you can do like unlimited syndicated deals. Actually, so they'll just you know put them out there. So the idea is to have like this big network. Like I'm gonna launch my product. I want a bunch of that needs like, to be on there. I want yeah. The ninety nine a month needs to have like because right now this is five active campaigns. And if you like, you also get syndicated well, on like we send out an email deals. to all of our ninety nine, all of our ninety, all of our customers on a ninety nine dollar plan, yeah. and we're like, hey, you can get this. Yeah. But I'm just saying that would sway me looking I at know, the page. I, if I saw the basic, I'm like, oh, ninety nine, mm, you get syndicated on this website. Yeah, I know. We're we're just working on it <laughs> with stuff. millions of views the, of traffic. The, yeah, all the hot, all the new hotness. That yeah, not everybody knows this about. is good. No, I like that. Um, so. What about, I remember talking to Brandon about, I don't know if he called it super URLs, um, where you can basically, when they're clicking through, you can sort of um, have certain keywords that are, it's like they're clicking on certain keywords. How do, is that still working the same or is that, that change at all? So we found, so. What do you call actually, that? Is, it, is that the wrong term? It's not super URL. It's, it's something, he called it something. I don't remember what it was, but. Super URL has kind of been the term that everybody's that's what it's called. In the okay. industry has decided is what it's going to be. Okay. So, I mean, to give some background on that, like it's a keyword rich. Yeah. Yeah. Go so ahead. we were we were one day on Amazon, we were goofing off, and we were just like looking at URLs because that's what we do at Seller Labs, <laughs> and um, and we were like, hey, look at all these like keywords in this URL, and then we're like, what's this QID thing? And we kind of started thinking about it and we started looking at it and we're like, oh my gosh, like whenever I search something on Amazon, they pass these keywords and this QID thing into, mm, light bulb. Yeah. into the thing. We're like, oh my gosh, we should build a product that like, you know, allows you to like pass in keywords and like, you know, do this QID. Yeah. And so we did, we actually built a product called search rank, which we don't advertise and we don't really sell anymore. Okay. But it allows you to like track your keyword position, which Scope does that, and then it allows you to generate this like super URL. I did actually, this super URL type thing. And then everybody else in the industry started like building their own super URL tool. And then we were kind of like, oh, it's kind of weird, kind of spammy. It's kind of hacky. We don't necessarily know if we want to like be all about this. And so we didn't really like get into it. And then Amazon released a policy update about like manipulation and stuff like this. And we kind of read into that that like one of those things was like we just thought Amazon really wouldn't appreciate a super URL. Yeah. It's too much, right? And so So it's of, really in the gray area right now. It's still I in the gray area. Is, yeah, I mean like I've heard from some people that from from some I've heard a source from a source yeah. said that they were the Jeff with, Bezos. Yeah, no, they I'm were speaking at well, it was a pretty high up like VP of something okay. at Amazon and they were like, Yeah, we don't like super URLs. Now I don't. I haven't necessarily heard of somebody getting their account suspended for using a super URL or anything like that. But I have. 
I, we just haven't really supported it actually in a long time. Right. And we have found that it's not really that effective anymore. Yeah, it's not worth the risk type of thing. It's just, yeah, it's not, it's not that effective. What we do, what we are going to release pretty soon is a way for you to rank for specific keywords. It's going to be super proprietary. We're not going to explain how we do it, but we do to have. To rank for certain keywords. Yeah, so you'll be able to target certain keywords and rank for them, and it's going to be really cool. Is that part of which product? It's going to be part of Snagshell 2.0, which is going to be called something completely different. So you're going to you're going to eliminate Snagshot? Snagshot will the still name? be there for for shoppers, but we're going to have we're going to have kind of basically we're building a, a new a new marketing platform um, that's going to you'll be able to do Snagshot, but you'll also be able to do syndication and a bunch of other really hmm. cool things. So we'll like still it. have Snagshot for, for the shoppers, but we'll have a whole new marketing platform. For the sellers. Be, for the sellers. For yep. the sellers. I want to ask about, Paul, thank you. This is, this is super valuable. So I hope you're having as much fun as me. Yeah, it's fun. This. fun um, I want to talk about some software tools and resources you recommend. Obviously, you know, it goes without saying Feedback Genius, Snagshot, Scope, Quantify. Um, before we talk about that, though, you were a professional musician. Yes. From a young yeah. age? I got my first guitar when I was 15 and um, are you going to play, I'll, are you going to play a prosper show? <laughs> <laughs> if James lets me, I will bring my Les Paul and All right. um, no. So yeah, I got my Cause guitar. Cause that's late to start. No, 16, yeah, it was late. 15. Yeah. I was late left-handed. I was terrible. Didn't know how to play anything. Ever, no one wanted to be in my band. Like was this to get girls? What, what, what made you start? I just had a friend that, okay. I met like in ninth grade and he played guitar and I thought it was really cool. And so then I'll, for Christmas one year, my parents were like, what do you want? And I was like, a guitar. And so they gave me a guitar, bought me a left-handed Mexican Strat. And um, I took a few lessons. I was really terrible. I kind of like left my guitar. I got my driver's license like a few months after that, turned 16. My guitar, I kind of, guitar kind of went on the back burner for a little while, put it in um, my trunk. And they got all out of like really bad, like how to take it to a guitar shop when I decided to pull it out to get it fixed, get it, get it set up again. And then I really started playing and, and my, between my, you know, my junior year, I was really like, I want to be a musician. And everyone That's was like, That's what you wanted to do. Yeah. But like, yeah, you're terrible at music. Why are you? <laughs> this is what someone told me. <laughs> and then my year, my, between my, um, sophomore and senior year in high school i the summer i just like got a bunch of guitar books sat down and just like really learned how to play guitar i just went to like and i and i took some lessons and um i started playing classical guitar and mm -hmm. on all these different things and before and then but, but i came back to high school you know 12th grade and everyone was like oh we want to be in your band now you're really good at guitar i was like i told you and um did you have a band then yeah so we had a band and the fighting and, geese What'd you call that? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, um, the band was called Interview. We were, it was. Uh, I like that. That's good. Not interview, but Interview. That's, oh, gotcha. I'm like, that's <laughs> going to be my new theme song for my, my Inspired Insider. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but, but the, you know, we made money playing, but the real money, like the reason why I can call myself a prof professional musician was because I taught, um, guitar lessons so i went back to the place that i took lessons at and they were like hey we need a guitar teacher and i was like cool i'll do it and so like my dream for the longest time was to literally open up my own guitar shop mm. and teach guitar lessons that's what i was going to do for the rest of my life and then i did that i actually like really i was in college well, when you were started, selling the guitars i started the discount guitar warehouse yeah. and then i opened up a retail location and i taught guitar so I'll can these that. any of your songs uh, be found on YouTube or anything? I don't think so, for good reason. Um, no, like my old band was not that great actually. When I think you know, like I've had some some rappers, like they happen to be white rappers, but um, <laughs> I have definitely found them and clipped them on the back of interviews or put them on the post. So I might. Uh, is there a way to scour the internet? Like, what was uh, the band called? I mean, like it was in, in. It was how do you spell it though? In I N N E R V, but you're not okay. gonna find. That I'm not gonna find it. Okay. Okay. No, I do have. Some, look, I have some CDs of like some interview. Stuff. I gotcha. Yeah. Um, cool. I love that. 
Um, so talk about some software tools, resources. What else should people be, obviously, you know, checking out Seller Labs suite. Um, what else should they be checking out that you find valuable for software tools? Just for specifically for the Amazon seller? Yeah, it could be Amazon or e-commerce in general. Okay. Um, so, okay. So for sourcing products, um, I haven't used this extensively, but Import Genius is pretty cool. So Import Genius, you can like go find, you can put in like a uh, competitor or whatever, and it'll like typically, if they haven't obscured stuff too much, you can like actually see the 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 manufacturer, wow. like the actual factory in China that they get their stuff from. So you can be like, you, know, you can get a lot of information and and find factories and stuff like that. It's fairly expensive. I think it's like. 400 bucks or something like that. I don't mm -hmm. know, but it's pretty cool. Um, let's see some other cool tools. So on the, um, on the, on, on the side of that, I ask cause you probably hear about everything with what you do and from your sellers. Yeah. So another thing on the sourcing side, I'm going to like walk through, yeah, go ahead. Time, but like still on sourcing, um, people love this. This isn't necessarily like a, a software that you would buy. It's like a, it's a website, but it's called Asia inspection. So if you're getting stuff made in um, China or whatever, you can go to Asia Inspection and for like how do you spell bucks, it? Is Asian Inspection? Asia Asia Inspection. Oh, Asia Inspection. Okay. Yeah, you can go there and get a um, order and inspection for like three hundred bucks. Oh, nice. And then you can also get like a lab test and all these different things done on your on on your product. So that's pretty cool software. Um, let's see. Go through. Um, if you're doing multi-channel listing, um, I'm afraid to like enter in, to. And I'm not going to endorse anything, but I think that Cellbrite is a pretty cool. It looks pretty cool. I haven't used it personally, but I think mm -hmm. it seems like if you're trying to sell, they actually have a hookup where you can kind of like hook up your uh, FBA, your FBA inventory. Oh, there's also Joe Lister actually, which is similar. So if you're trying to like expand to other channels, you can look at you know some of those things. Celebrate uh, or Joe Lister. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and then like if you're just doing orders, obviously Skubana. You've done some stuff with Skubana. Yeah. Before they're more. Chad expensive. rocks the mic at Prosper Show. Yeah, they're more. They're more. Um, they're more for like bigger customers, I would say. Yeah. Um, typically. Um, yeah, Skubana is for bigger, bigger type customers. Bigger type customers for sure. Um, what else? Let's see. So uh, this is something that people probably already know, but just using like Google Keyword Planner and stuff like that is, is always um, useful. And then if you're not using um, accounting software, like everybody should be using QuickBooks Online or maybe Xero. I think uh, we used to use Xero and then QuickBooks Online got a lot better and yeah. now we use that and we love Why'd it. Why'd you switch? QuickBooks Online, okay, so we could probably have a whole podcast about this. Yeah. Um, so Because this is the, sort of the fundamental stuff. Like I like, I wouldn't glaze over it, right? Like 80-20 stuff is huge, even though people know it. You know, Google Keyword Planner, QuickBooks Online, that's that's sort of keeping track of everything. So Oh, here's another one, Slack. Slack, yeah. Slack. If you have if you have a team, use Slack. I think it's great for, for uh, communication. Yeah, so Xero used to be a nicer user interface. It was made to be online. It was kind of like online first kind of stuff. Like QuickBooks was like really lagging. It was clunky. It wasn't very good. But as soon as you hire a bookkeeper or an accountant, they all want QuickBooks, like every single one. And QuickBooks Online is actually really good now. Yeah. It's actually They've better. They've improved it. Zero. So if you're going like – I know it's tempting to use something simpler like a FreshBooks or a Zero or something like that. But if you're gonna yeah. hire, um, a if you're gonna hire people, a bookkeeper, yeah. then I think QuickBooks is really yeah. the way to go. I like so. QuickBooks Online for a lot of reasons, but one reason is I can talk to a human being. I can yep. actually call up and get a customer service person online. Zero, they have no no phone support whatsoever. Which sometimes you just want to call someone. Oh, here's a couple Brilliant. other softwares so I was yeah. thinking. Yeah. If you're doing off Amazon email, um, you would want to do like, you know, obviously you have your MailChimp, you have your Aweber. Mm -hmm. um, GitDrip is actually a pretty cool mm. Yeah, software. they were just purchased by LeadPages. Yeah, they got pages. purchased by LeadPages. Yeah. yeah. 
We actually use Git Drip for. We used to nice. use HubSpot, which is like really expensive. We'll give Rob Walling a shout out. Or <laughs> yep. <you> know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do like Git Drip. Actually, if you're doing any type of email marketing, um, let's see. Eh, yeah, that's pretty good. Any conferences you like outside of you know obviously Prosper Show? What other conferences do you like to to check out? Do you go to MicroConf? No. Oh, you don't. Uh, okay. The only so the three conferences that I will consider attending this year, so I'm going to Prosper. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is Internet Retail, like IRCE. Mm -hmm. um, and that one, if you're an Amazon seller, you might not get as much value. Mm -hmm. They have an, a pre-conference day, um, which is uh, they have a workshop for Amazon. It's, it's okay. But I like going there to see like the trends in the e-commerce industry, yeah. and then they have like probably the most extensive like vendors. They're huge. It's like what like seven or eight hundred exhibitors or something. Yeah, I think that's like a really good place to go to get your finger on the pulse of everything. Like if you're yeah. if you're a small if you're a small seller and you're bootstrapping, like don't waste your money going to IRCE. Like it's not worth it. But if you have the cash. And you want to learn a lot, it's a good place to go. Yeah. Um, another good conference to go to, I'll plug ours. I don't know when we're gonna do it, but we did a we we did our first conference last year. It's called Resonate. Where was uh, it? It was in Atlanta. Okay. Um it was small. It's a good we name. You guys only, are good at naming things. <laughs> we spend a lot of time thinking about it, probably too much. Um and Why yeah, Atlanta? Well, just because we're, because you're local? Or? Yeah, we just did it. We're in okay. Athens and that's like yeah. we didn't have to fly anybody in, you know, it was like a, a it was funny, like we charged three hundred dollars for the conference, but we like we did. We're I, I should say we're not going to do this next year, but we actually provided. We did like an escape the room event. What is that? And it's like this crazy game where like everyone like gets in the teams and there's like a bomb you have to defuse and do all this That's fun cool. stuff. So we did that. It was like an unconference. Jeff did it all. Um, what do you mean by unconference? Like, like there you know, weren't you really go, speakers. You go to like, we had speakers, but like there was no sponsors. It was really intimate. We made we made everybody verify. Um, so we only our goal was to only invite people that were either doing a million dollars or more on Amazon or trending towards right. that. Um, we're gonna open it up this year to other people. We're gonna have probably tracks, and we might. When do, do you like usually a, have it, or when did you? When are you gonna have it? I think we're gonna do it in May. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. We haven't even picked a location yet. We might not do it in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, but that one, it's just a different type of conference. Like right. we go to, a, we used to go to a lot of conferences, and so we know you've narrowed it, or at least you personally have narrowed it. It, it. It's nice for us. I mean, we so we took everybody to Brazilian barbecue. I mean, we're, like I said, we're, we might not do it as crazy right the next time, but it will be a good. I want to use a, a bomb. Wow. It was cool. Well, we'll do, it's going to be different this year, but it was a cool conference. We didn't make money on it, like, but it was fun. Well, you know, you, know, you have um, products that people, you know. Yeah, right. It was a marketing. Not thing. everyone has his products, like a back end of products. Right. You know? And so it was funny, though, because like people like we asked for feedback, you know, and e like everyone was like, we loved it. We want to come again. We're like, What's one thing we can do better? And they're like, sell us your stuff more. Hmm. They're like, didn't like talk about. I wonder if you ask them how, what would they say? I don't know, but they didn't like, we didn't really like talk about our products the whole conference. Yeah. We just invited like yeah. all of the experts and. Yeah, you know, I, th I think uh, I get a sense, you know, it's not like you're jamming down the throat, but I think if it's providing value for people, they want to know how it could help them. You know, like, right. I mean, I was just obviously interested not for you just to plug it, but just to learn, okay, you know, you can, um, this, this keyword tool could, you could use it for the sponsored ads. You can use it for your listings. You know what I mean? Right. So there's ways that they can optimize their, their sales. Yeah. I mean, for me, like if we were just trying to make money, I actually would have stopped at feedback genius, believe it or not. In the long, and because and the 80, 20 rule. <laughs> yeah. Because like, we could have ran feedback genius with like three people and it makes a lot of revenue. Like it really right, does. Right. And, and, but the idea is that like, I want people to win on Amazon. Like I yeah. legitimately love seeing businesses do well. And so I, I spend, we, we're, we are an Amazon think tank. Like 
we literally like sit around thinking about yeah. ways that people can do better on Amazon. And then we come up with an idea and it like has to exist. Right. It's like, this needs to exist and I need to find a way for people to pay for this so it can like fund, fund it, you know, but like it, right. it, it, it's Self-funding, like funding. Yeah. It, it needs to exist. I have to charge for it because it costs me hundreds of thousands of dollars in, you know, engineering resources for or sure. millions of dollars in engineering resources to build. Yeah. But and like, you want to sustain it. You want to. I want you know, it to be around wanna, for the long yeah. term. I want to keep making it better. Paul, this is awesome. So people should check out sellerlabs.com. I could talk to you all day. I know you have something in like eleven minutes. Um, wh- what's one trend or idea you can give away that someone's not executing on? Oh, that's a good question. Let's see. Okay, so I was talking to Jeff about this th- this morning. Um, yeah. Keep mentioning Jeff. We should bring him on the next one. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'll talk about product research actually that yeah. I think people are, I, I think people look at Amazon kind of myopic, myopically like that. So you'll, you'll come in and you'll be like, I want to look at, I want to sell a product on Amazon or I want to improve my product. And so you go to your product and you look at your product and you look at it in a vacuum and you say like, I have a water bottle and you look at like your water bottle or you look at like one competitor or something like that. Right. And like if you really want to if you really want to understand what you need to do on Amazon, you need to look at the entire category, the entire subcategory on Amazon, like aggregate all of that data into one place and then understand like where that entire category is moving. So for example, let's say that you want to source a product and and you decide that um, this is really a transformer of a strategy, but I'm going with it. Yeah, go with uh, it. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, you, you decide that you want to you, you 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 stumble across a I don't know some some trending thing, a, a tool, a, a wrench, or something like that, and you say, okay, this wrench sells for thirty bucks, and I know I can source this thing for five dollars from China. And it only has 50 reviews, and it's selling a lot, and it's really good. Well, that's great, but what you pro- what you might not have realized is like that wrench had like some special brand name on there or something like that that was like dr- commanding that high price. And if you actually looked at like the entire subcategory of Amazon, or if you look at like the keywords that are driving sales for that product, yeah. people are using know- one piece of data and extrapolating it when it maybe not. Not meant to be extrapolated. Right, so you need to look at it like a holistic approach. And I guess, yeah. so the trend is that people are not using data enough, right? I think that they need to, they need to get a complete picture of the problem, um, whether it's researching your competition or looking at your own business. And I think that it's difficult to do. It's, it's like not an easy thing. And so educate yourself on how to do that and whatever tools are out there, like whether it's ours or somebody else's, like use that information to make your business better because you don't want to get a, you don't, I've seen a lot of people really shoot themselves in the foot, like from the beginning, like they go and they find a product and they think, oh man, this one product sells so well, I'm going to sell it. They spend $10,000 ordering inventory in and they didn't realize that like they're never even going to, they don't even have the margin to like dictate it because they didn't look at the rest of the field on what they're doing. They didn't realize that they, they were looking at this one data point at fourteen ninety nine average sales price when really the market commands a nine ninety nine sales price and they're gonna lose money if they try to sell at that price. Right. And so, you know, I think, you know, leveraging the the new technologies that are coming out that are like really imploring data is going to be important. I think Amazon is going to get more competitive, but I think that if you if you use the information wisely, there's still lots of money to be made. Yeah. Paul, thank you so much. Everyone should check out sellerlabs.com. I want to be the first one. Thank you. We'll see you at Prosper Show. Yeah, thanks for having me. See you then. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the sand right now. I feel like a hundred grand.